we're talking with John Braxton, and uh, John has a very interesting story. So, John was on the original uh, Phoenix ship that was a sister ship to the Golden Rule. The Golden Rule was sailing for the Marshall Islands, and they got stopped and uh, taken to Hawaii, where they were arrested. And uh, there was another ship that was berthed a couple docks over, and that was the Phoenix. And the uh, Phoenix was captained by this guy, what was his name? Earl Reynolds. Yeah, and uh, he had been investigating the effects of radiation on children in, in Hiroshima. And so he was a little bit incensed that the, the cruel of the Golden Rule had gotten arrested. So um, just take it from there. <laughs> yeah, it's one of these uh, interesting sort of quirks of history that uh, Earl and his family had been sailing around the world for, I believe, about three and a half years and were in Hawaii, were heading back on the last leg of their trip to Japan, um, and they happened to run into the crew of the Golden Rule, and they learned that the, that the Golden Rule was protesting the fact that the U.S. was s testing nuclear weapons right there uh, by bombing the islands, the Marshall Islands. Uh, and of course, there were people living on those islands. Uh, the radiation was spreading all over the place, uh, <clears throat> really all around the world. Uh, and so, and, and Earl had been studying the effects of radiation uh, as a result of the U.S. dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so he'd been living in Japan for several years and studying those effects, and he, and he knew that they were serious. And <clears throat> so, so when he realized that, well, here was this other ship, that was sailing there to protest this testing. Uh, he and his family got together and talked about it and they agreed uh, it was the right thing to do for them to do the same thing. And the other thing was that <clears throat> they were gonna be sailing right through that area anyway to get to Japan. And just as a sailor, he didn't think the United States had the right to say, you can't sail somewhere on the open seas. So he objected both because of his expertise in the effects of radiation and also just uh, as a sailor. Uh, you know, nobody tells a sailor where to go. <laughs> and, um, so that was the beginning of, he, he actually then sailed uh, the ship also to what was then the Soviet Union and protested their testing of nuclear weapons. He sailed to both Leningrad and Vladivostok, uh, and uh, part of Russia today, and protested that. And so that was the history of, of the Phoenix, kind of a sister ship to the Golden Rule. And then if we fast forward to 1967, there were a group of Quakers in Philadelphia. I was only 18 at the time. Um, but um, there are a group of Quakers who decided that they wanted to make as, as strong a protest as they could figure out how against the war. Um, Quakers had been anti-war for their entire history, but this war in particular was one where, where we recognized that the U.S. was responsible for the continuation and the escalation of the war, and that we really had no business being over there. And so we had tried shipping medical, we had tried a number of things. We had done some demonstrations. Some members of this group called a Quaker Action Group uh, had a sit-in in, in the uh, Senate gallery to protest the war and they were arrested for doing that. Um, and we tried sending some medical supplies to civilians uh, to the North Vietnamese Red Cross and we could send medical supplies through Canada because there wasn't any possibility of sending them directly commercially from the U.S. Um, but then the government froze the bank accounts of a Quaker Action Group, said uh, this is trading with the enemy and it's a violation of the Export Control Act. Uh, 
Um, and of course we said, well, we're not trading with the enemy. Uh, we're not trading at all. We're, this is a donation. And furthermore, we don't consider them to be our enemy. We didn't really see that they harmed us in any way. And we didn't hold, like the whole idea of any human being our enemy. So, um, but we, what we could no longer ship through Canada because they'd frozen our bank accounts. Uh, then somebody got the idea of, well, we know Earl Reynolds, and he's used this ship to protest nuclear weapons in both Russia, Soviet Union, and the U.S. And um, I wonder if he'd be willing to sail to North Vietnam with a load of medical supplies. <clears throat> this posed the same legal problem. It was still considered a violation of the, the Export Control Act and the Trading with the Enemy Act, uh, each of which is punishable by five years in prison and $10,000 fine. Um, but we thought that this would be a dramatic way that we could provide a little bit of medical assistance uh, to, to people who'd been hurt by our bombing of North Vietnam. And, um, and, and also a way, so it was both a humanitarian mission, but it was also, um, it was a political protest that we were saying, we're prepared to risk prison and maybe worse. We didn't really know to start with whether the Air Force or the Navy would try to sink the boat, uh, which they could, of course, very easily do because we were a 50-foot wooden, wooden boat and they've got a lot of firepower. Um, so the first trip, uh, Earl Reynolds agreed right away. He said, that's a good idea. Uh, he was always game for a good protest at sea. And so we loaded about $10,000 worth of medical supplies onto the Phoenix, and it sailed from Hiroshima to Hong Kong uh, and then to Haiphong in North Vietnam. And that was in March of 1967, and I was not a member of that crew. I was active with a Quaker Action Group, uh, but not a member of that crew. <clears throat> and it attracted a huge amount of publicity all around the world um, because it was, it was what nonviolent strategists today refer to as a, di a dilemma demonstration. It puts, but puts the government in an awkward position do you stop people from delivering medical supplies? Well, that doesn't make the U.S. government look too good. Uh, on the other hand, do you let them violate your law uh, and not try to stop them? And that makes them look kind of weak. So it puts them in a dilemma where they, they kind of don't have a good option. <clears throat> so that trip uh, went very well. It got a lot of publicity. Uh, there was a almost one hour documentary made by the Canadian Broadcasting Company who had a cameraman on board. <clears throat> and, um, and then the Quaker Action Group decided that um, they wanted to send another shipload to North Vietnam. And I was lucky because I was young, healthy, and the first crew had had a lot of middle-aged people on it. I'm I'm 74 now, so those middle-aged people are, are all younger than I am. <laughs> so they didn't look, they, they looked old then. They don't look so old to me now. Uh, but um, they wanted some young, able bodies. I didn't know a thing about sailing. Um, but I was able-bodied and willing to learn. And so, so I flew over to Hiroshima and where the, where the Phoenix was docked. And after we got the boat all ready to go, it's interesting, the Phoenix is quite famous uh, in Japan, or at least it was at that time. This is a long time ago now. But um, f uh, famous because nuclear weapons are really unpopular in Japan, and you can imagine why. And um, so any boat that was protesting nuclear weapons was really appreciated. And here we were also on an, another peace mission, another mission calling for an end to a war. And of course, there were U.S. politicians that were saying, hey, we've got these nuclear weapons. Why don't we use them in Vietnam? So it wasn't entirely off the table by any means. So we got this wonderful send-off um, 
they they made us a, uh, these lays made of paper cranes, you know, around, that they wrapped around our necks, and so there were dozens and dozens of Japanese that brought us these paper crane lays, which actually have their own history, uh, because there's a uh, a legend in Japan that. Um, if, you, if I understand it correctly, that if you make a thousand paper cranes out of folded squares of paper, um, that you, you will become immortal. Uh, and this became particularly famous when there was a young girl who developed leukemia as a result of the dropping of our nuclear weapons in Hiroshima. And she started folding paper cranes with the idea that she could get to a thousand and maybe defeat her leukemia. But unfortunately, she didn't get that far. She died before that could happen. But that kind of, I think, gave more momentum to this idea of making these paper cranes as a gesture of peace. Um, so we had this huge send off from Hiroshima and sailed to Hong Kong um, the sailing itself was quite an adventure. We were on the edge of a typhoon at one point. And uh, so, you know, we had these giant 30-foot waves that were bouncing in this 50-foot boat all around. But uh, our captain and our first mate knew a lot about sailing, and, and they could tell me what to do. I was just, I was just muscle on the, on the ship. And not that much muscle, but <laughs> enough muscle to pull those ropes. And so we got to Hiroshima, uh, I'm sorry, we got to Hong Kong, and um, the North Vietnamese then said they really appreciated our interest, but they didn't want us to come right then because it, it was too dangerous and they couldn't guarantee our safety. And we said, we're willing to take the risk. They said, well, there's, you know, there's just bombing going on all the time and, and we really don't want you to come right now. So we had to respect that. So we actually decided, well, let's take a shipload of a different set of medicines uh, to take to South Vietnam, because we were not trying to say that we were militarily in favor of one side or another. We were, we were in favor of an end of the war. Um, and we knew that meant that the U.S. had to pull out. Um, but... We were not in favor particularly of a, of a military victory. We would just like the war to end. And we wanted to help anybody that was suffering. So we bought a new set of medical supplies to take to South Vietnam, got permission to take them to South Vietnam. But when we got to Da Nang, the local officials wouldn't let us in. They said, uh, anchor out here in the harbor for tonight. Um, it's a safe harbor, they said. And then all night long, they lobbed mortar shells over our heads onto the shoreline on the other side because Da Nang was the only way they could keep Da Nang safe from being overrun by the North Vietnamese and the National Liberation Front was by bombing the hillside all night long, um, which was an indication of how little popular support the South Vietnamese government had. Well, there, there was, uh, <clears throat> the first time that uh, Phoenix came, they tried to go out and deliver some supplies to South Vietnam also, right? The, the first trip on the Phoenix to Vietnam was to North Vietnam. And then this one that I was on was to South Vietnam. Oh, I see. So the first trip didn't go to uh, South Vietnam. No, the first trip went to North Vietnam. Oh. Yeah. So when we got to Da Nang, then we... <laughs> You know, we were in this so-called safe harbor. Um, and the next day they said, no, you don't have permission to come here. And we said, well, we got permission when we were in Hong Kong. And they said, well, you don't have it now. And we said, well, why not? You, don't you need these medical supplies? And the Vietnamese we were talking with were very cordial. And they said, yes, we need them. We appreciate it, but we have orders. Uh, and you have to leave. And we said... Well, we're not going to leave until we talk to the person who's who can actually give us a reason uh, instead of just saying we have orders. And um, so 
they said, well, we're going to have to tow you out. And we said, well, we had thought about this. We'd spent a lot of time strategizing. Um, we said, well, if you try to tow us out, we're prepared to jump overboard and swim to shore and try to talk to somebody who made this decision. And they said, oh, you don't want to do that. Um, there's poisonous snakes in the water and um, there's VC, Viet Cong, on the shoreline. Uh, they don't like Americans. <laughs> and uh, we said, well, you know, we are determined to find out why we can't come in here and that's what we're prepared to do. So um, they boarded our ship, South Vietnamese uh, gunboat uh, came along. Uh, we were perfectly friendly with them and they were friendly with us. Uh, and they started to crank up our anchor, which is a, a lot of work. We, we thought that's great. We don't like cranking up that anchor. Uh, and, but then uh, we had decided that two of our crew would jump overboard. And so the first one jumped overboard and started swimming towards shore. They sent in some swimmers after him from the South Vietnamese gunboat. Uh, and then our second crew member jumped overboard and started swimming towards shore. Well, they surrounded the second crew member right away and pulled him up onto their boat. Uh, and, but the first one got away. And he just, we joked a lot because he'd been very, very seasick. He hadn't, he hadn't kept any food down for a week. And um, we thought he just wanted to get the heck off the boat. <laughs> but that wasn't really giving him credit. He also, he was on a mission. And so he got to shore. He knew that there was a highway running up and down the coast that if he turned south, he would surely run into a military post after a while, and he did, and he said, I want to talk to the top general around here and find out why it is that we're not being allowed in. So they locked him up overnight, um, and sure enough, the next day, they actually let him talk to the top Vietnamese general in the area, and he said two things. He said, first of all, you already delivered medical supplies to North Vietnam, and they're our enemy. So that makes you persona non grata. And second of all, you wanted to deliver half of your supplies to the United Buddhist Church. And they're our domestic enemy. The Buddhist Church had been protesting the war in their own way, some of which was incredibly brave, incredibly dramatic, where some of the Buddhist monks would actually douse themselves in gasoline and immolate themselves and die uh, in protest to the government's their own South Vietnamese government's prosecution of the war. So they didn't want us to bolster in any way this Buddhist church, which was actually kind of philosophically closer aligned to us. As Quakers, we were nonviolent and the Buddhists were nonviolent. Um, so by having the ones, one of our crew members get away, um, they stopped trying to tow the boat out that night, and we spent the, another night in this so-called safe harbor. Well, the next day they brought Harrison back, Harrison Butterworth was his name, and um, they brought him back and he said he'd, he'd talked to the top general. He'd been given a reason, it wasn't a good reason, but he'd been given a reason, um, and we talked it over and decided that um, we would, would uh, allow them to tow us out this time without jumping overboard. In the meantime, by the way, a, the, the, we knew that the U.S. press and the world press were very interested in what we were doing, and they sent out a press boat to try to interview us, and the South Vietnamese fired machine gun bullets in their direction, and they wisely turned around and went, went back to the dock. We had hoped that the combination of pressure from the press and maybe from the Buddhist church would convince the South Vietnamese to change their minds. And we said, well, after you tow us out, we're, gonna, we're not going to leave right away. We're going to sail up and down outside the harbor uh, in hopes that you'll change your mind. And so for a couple of days, we did that. And then 
they sent out a gunboat to follow us and harass us. Uh, and they fired machine gun bullets, not directly at us, but alongside of us. And then at one point they crashed into us. And it did not appear to be a deliberate, uh, they didn't like ram us deliberately, but on the other hand, uh, it was clear that if you pull up a big steel ship against a, a, a 50 foot wooden boat, um, bad things are going to happen. And, uh, and they in fact damaged the ship, not in a way that made it uh, like it was going to sink or anything, but it meant that we couldn't sail back to Hong Kong very well because Hong Kong was upwind. So we decided to sail downwind to Saigon area and see if they would let us in down there. Um, but when we got to Saigon, we couldn't get in there either. Um, so then we sailed around the tip of, of southern South Vietnam and up to Cambodia, where we uh, hoped we could at least get the boat repaired. Uh, the Cambodians did not want to officially let us in because they were at that time led by uh, Prince Sihanouk, who was keeping the country neutral in the war. Uh, both the North Vietnamese and the National Liberation Front were using Cambodia as staging grounds for their raids into South Vietnam, and the U.S. was bombing uh, over the line in Cambodia, although they didn't admit it for a long time. Uh, and the, so the Cambodian government said, we don't want to do anything to uh, get any more hostility from the U.S., so we're not going to officially let you come in. Um, but you can anchor off this island here and you can get resupplied and you can get your boat fixed up. So we were able to get that done. And, um, and then we got word that the North Vietnamese would welcome us to come in uh, during the traditional Tet New, Lunar New Year holiday, which is a period of time when the war uh, kind, of, kind of had a a semi-official ceasefire for a couple of days. And that had been happening for each year. Uh, so we did travel around, uh, sailed back to Hong Kong, resupplied, got the supplies that were going to North Vietnam, uh, and went on into North Vietnam. And we were there during the 1968 Tet uh, Lunar New Year celebration. That was also the famous Tet Offensive during the war, uh, when it turned out that the North Vietnamese and National Liberation Front uh, went on this huge offensive where they overran most of the cities of South Vietnam um, and occupied them for weeks at a time. And that was the first time it became totally clear to the world that the U.S. was losing the war. It was clear that uh, you couldn't have that many North Vietnamese and National Liberation troops uh, invading those cities <clears throat> unless there was an awful lot of popular support for them. And so they couldn't hold those cities. They, the U.S. had enough military power to go anywhere they wanted and eventually could expel them from the cities. But the fact that they could occupy the major cities for weeks at a time uh, was an indication that the U.S., and the South Vietnamese government just didn't have any popular support. Meanwhile, we were there in North Vietnam, <clears throat> and they welcomed us with open arms. To, to, they believed very strongly that the peace movement in the United States would be crucial to getting the U.S. to pull out, that <clears throat> they could fight, they were prepared to fight for decades if they had to, because the Vietnamese had fought against the French for decades. Then they fought against the Japanese during World War II. Then they fought against the French again after World War II. And now they're fighting the U.S. occupation. And they were pre prepared to do that. But they knew that ultimately <clears throat> it would be a combination of the military pressure that they could put on and the domestic political pressure that the peace movement could put on. And so they considered us to be heroes and treated us that way. And they said over and over again, 
we don't consider the American people to be our enemy. We think that if they really understood what was going on, the American people would not support this war. And of course, more and more of that was happening. Um, the longer the war dragged on, the more wounded veterans came back, veterans coming back telling their stories of the horrible things they'd been ordered to do. Um, and of course, American bodies coming back also. Um, so the tide was starting to turn, of pub the public opinion tide was starting to turn against the war. And we were able to go back to the United States uh, and demonstrate to the people that we spoke to that the United States had been lying to us, that they had been saying that the bombing that we were doing, that our government was doing in our names in North Vietnam was so-called precision targeting of military targets only. And we were able to see that they were bombing civilian areas and that, the, that they were using weapons that were anti-personnel weapons, which really are not, they're not aimed at military targets. They're aimed at people. Um, they're terribly devastating. They, um, you have about a six foot canister that has 300 little bomblets the size of your fist and inside each of them are a bunch of little pellets or even little metal arrows, uh, little razor sharp arrows. And when they explode, it fills the air uh, the size of uh, a few football fields with these little pellets. Um, and if you're a, a well defended military target, it probably doesn't do that much damage. But if you're bombing a civilian area, then uh, these pellets go into the human flesh, um, and they may they may not kill, um, but they wound and maim in such a way that it actually is harder for for the civilian population to recover because you have to put this huge amount of resource into treating these terribly wounded people, and we got to see some of those people in the hospital, so we knew firsthand that this was happening and. So our stories when we came back were part of that effort of hundreds and thousands of other people who were protesting the war and showing that the U.S. had no business there to begin with. We were not on the side of democracy. Um, actually, President Eisenhower had recognized and his advisors had recognized that had an election been held that the North Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh would win hands down uh, because he had been a fighter against the Japanese and a fighter against the French and he was kind of like their George Washington. And um, so this wasn't about democracy. Uh, it was about the U.S. imposing its will on this small country um, that did not want to be imposed upon. So this was... Um, you know, a real, this was a turning point in my life. I had already been opposed to the war when I, when I went onto the Phoenix, but now seeing the effects firsthand made me all the more committed to try to end the war, to do whatever I could to end the war. I'm only one person. I knew I was only one person, but uh, what more could I do? So I got very involved in, um, the peace movement when I came back here and it, in some ways I it's remarkable that I managed to pass my courses in college and graduate because I spent more of my time organizing peace demonstrations <laughs> than I did studying uh, and my my professors were were very lenient uh, uh, I think they respected what I was doing uh, I don't, I don't think they gave me a free pass, but uh, I, I do remember at one point uh, I was involved in another protest where I was arrested when somebody else was refusing induction. And I had to tell my professor, I'm not going to be there for the, for the test tomorrow because I have a court appearance. <laughs> and uh, he graciously let me take the test at a different time. So... Um, and eventually then I refused to cooperate with the draft. Um, I, I was raised as a Quaker and 
had been given a conscientious objector status. So I could have uh, worked in a civilian hospital here in the U.S. for two years as what was called alternative service. So instead of serving in the military, I would serve in a civilian capacity. And there were many, many people that got that conscientious objector status. But there are many people who were denied it, who deserved it. Um, it was given much more easily to people who belonged to certain religious traditions. So if you were a Quaker, it was easy to get it. If you were a Mennonite, it was easy to get it. Um, a Church of the Brethren. Um, and, uh, and also, if you had the right kind of education that allowed you to persuasively convince a draft board that you were opposed to war in any form. And they draft boards would often ask tricky questions like, uh, well, what would you do if someone tried to attack your grandmother? Um, or would you have fought in World War II? Um, and those are hard questions for anybody to answer, um, much less an 18-year-old kid who's just barely out of high school, if that. And so I considered that conscience objector position to be kind of an escape valve for the military. It was like, okay, we'll take these few thousand people who would not cooperate with the military if we put them in it, and we'll put them over there and let them do some civilian work. Um, and that kind of gets them out of our hair for a while. Um, and as a friend of mine who was actually the, the skipper on the, the boat, the captain on the boat on the second trip to North Vietnam, um, as he said, um, it's kind of like saying, uh, I don't mind if you all do the fighting as long as I don't have to. Uh, and we wanted to take a stronger position that we, we think the whole system is wrong. The whole war system is wrong. The draft is wrong. The government shouldn't have the right to just tell somebody you're mine for two years to do whatever I tell you to do. And so, uh, I followed his lead, uh, and uh, returned my draft cards to my draft board and said, I'm not going to cooperate. Um, and they went ahead and ordered me to work in a civilian hospital. But um, I publicly said, you know, the work is good. I, I, I respect people that do that kind of work, but I'm not going to do it as part of the system that drafts people. And the main function of this system is to prosecute this war. Uh, and this war which the United States has no business in. And so, um, and then I continued to lead some demonstrations. I was the, the coordinator for what was called the Vietnam Moratorium here in Philadelphia. And this was a series of demonstrations that happened all over the country in October of 1969. And, um, and there were just hundreds of thousands of people that participated all over the country. The idea was uh, take a day out of your normal routine and work for peace that day. And so the, the newspapers and the TV were just filled with stories about this happening uh, all over the country. And then the following month, there was a massive demonstration in Washington, D.C., where hundreds of thousands of people uh, participated. And the message was, bring our troops home. Um, we're, not, we're not blaming the troops for this war. Uh, they're following orders, uh, but we want, the, we want the orders to change. We want the people at the top to say it's, it's time to bring our troops home. And interestingly enough, at the time, President Nixon was saying, well, I'm not paying any attention to those demonstrations. In fact, I, I didn't even look out the window, I'm just watching the football game on TV. Um, but we now know from his aides who have testified, uh, and there's a, there's a really good movie called, uh, I think it's called The, the Movement and the Madman, uh, or maybe it's The Madman and the Movement. But the madman in this title was Richard Nixon, and he had been floating this idea with his advisors, 
that if he acted crazy enough, the North Vietnamese would think that he was willing to drop nuclear weapons, and he was ordering people to look into the possibility of dropping nuclear weapons. And he said, if they think I'm that crazy, surely they'll surrender. And, um, but he got convinced by all these demonstrations that it was politically not feasible. And then, of course, in the spring of 1970, uh, he invaded Cambodia, officially. They had been doing sorties into Cambodia and bombing Cambodia for a long time, but they officially invaded it. Um, and all of, most of the college campuses around the country shut down. They just stopped functioning. The college students, and I was a senior that year, um, colleges just went out, uh, went, essentially went on strike. Nobody called it that. Uh, but essentially they just said, you know, we're going to take to the streets. And Nixon realized that he just politically couldn't continue this escalation. Uh, and eventually he had to start withdrawing troops. Uh, he called it Vietnamization. But what became increasingly clear was that the, the, really it was a puppet government in South Vietnam. That it, was, it only existed because of U.S. support. And the, the more the U.S. pulled troops out of South Vietnam, the weaker that government became. Um, and so, of course, eventually the um, North Vietnamese and the National Liberation Front, in fact, overran all of the cities of, Saigon, of South Vietnam, including what was then called Saigon, sometimes now is called Ho Chi Minh City. And, um, and the U.S. had to pull out. So... Ultimately, I think that the North Vietnamese uh, were right, that it was a combination of their military fight and our domestic fight back home that made it politically impossible. U.S. clearly had the military potential to just kill everybody in Vietnam, but um, politically they couldn't pull that off. You know, I should tell, I should back up and tell a story of one of the things that happened when we were in North Vietnam, because it, to me it was, it was very profound. We had been meeting with lots of government officials who always told us we we're not hostile to the American people. Um, in, in fact, they incorporated, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal into their constitution. Um, we're not anti-American, but we are against this government of yours that is prosecuting this war. And I had to wonder what, what the average Viet North Vietnamese person thought. You know, okay, this is what the North Vietnamese officials think. What did the, you know, what did the average person think? And so at one point, we had a little bit of free time, and I was walking around in a park in Haiphong on my own. Uh, and there were a bunch of kids there. Uh, and they saw this European looking guy. Uh, I had a pretty good suntan at that point because I'd been sailing on the boat for quite a few months. And they, when they saw somebody European who, who looked a little bit darker than I am most of the time, but I was darker then, they assumed I was from Cuba because there were Cubans that were around in North Vietnam at the time. Uh, so they came up to me, and they didn't speak English. I knew almost no, I mean, really, literally, virtually no Vietnamese. But they said, they looked at me and they said, Cuba si, Yankee no. And I pointed to myself and said, Yankee. <laughs> and they stopped, they kind of froze for a second. Um, and then... They came in closer, and one of them said, and I had said my name, I had told them my name, John Braxton. And one of them said, John Braxton, mon homme. And pretty soon, several of them said, John Braxton, mon homme. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this Vietnamese phrase, but we had heard that phrase over and over again uh, with the mon homme, because we would hear uh, it in the, uh, and what it meant was long live because we heard it, long live world peace, long live Ho Chi Minh. And here it was, long live John Braxton. <laughs> so it was, 
that just made it clear to me that even these young children um, had been taught that we don't hate the American people. Um, the American people are basically good people. They're, they either are on our side now or they, they would be and will be when they understand what, what the truth is about this war, that this is a war of national liberation. Um, and <clears throat> so that convinced me that the, that the North Vietnamese and the NLF really did not want to be our enemy. They just wanted to have their own country to themselves and be able to decide amongst themselves what kind of government, what kind of economy to have. Years later, in 2014, I visited North Vietnam again. And I, I went to a place where a bunch of the North Vietnamese um, veterans would go for... Um, they could go for a weekend or a week and uh, kind of get some rest and recreation. Uh, and so I, I started talking with these veterans through an interpreter. And uh, I said, um, I, I had brought with them pictures of me on the Phoenix uh, and said, I delivered medical supplies to North Vietnam during the war in violation of our government's laws. Uh, and I also went to prison for uh, 16 and a half months uh, in violation of our government's laws in protest to the war. Um, and as soon as they heard this, these veterans came up and, and just started hugging me and shaking my hand and just saying, and then through the interpreter saying, we always, we always knew that there were peace movement people that were trying to stop the war and that these were the real Americans, but we never met one before. <laughs> and it was, it was almost like they'd met <laughs> like a ghost or, <laughs> you know, uh, some, uh, some fictional creature <laughs> that, that they had heard about and heard about and heard of, you know, it was like, you know, what would you think if you actually met Superman? <laughs> uh, and, uh, but that also then just, and these were just ordinary, once again, these were ordinary people. These were not high up government officials. But they also understood um, that, and I think it was the best way that the North Vietnamese could explain to their people, that it's the best way that the officials could explain to their people, why would the Americans be doing this? Uh, and the only reason that made sense was it wasn't the Americans that wanted to do this to the Vietnamese. It was some very misguided government officials. So, um, so I take a lot of pride in the fact that ultimately there were enough Americans. Uh, and, and of course, the Golden Rule ship is now being crewed and owned by Veterans for Peace. And uh, the, the veterans coming back played a crucial role in convincing the American people that the war was wrong. And so collectively, we all figured out how to, uh, to bring that war to a close. And um, the unfortunate thing is that we still have this huge war machine in this country. Uh, we still have a Pentagon budget that in terms of the what they call the discretionary budget, the amount that Congress allocates in different ways every year, um, the Pentagon uh, occupies more than 50% of that budget. So half of our tax dollars, not including Medicare, not including Social Security, those are separate funds, but half of our federal tax dollars um, go to this war machine. Uh, and it's bigger than the next six or seven or eight countries' military budgets put together. So if you added uh, Russia, China, uh, and all the, all the next six or seven different military budgets, you added them all together, we, we exceed all of that put together. And some of those military budgets are countries that are our allies anyway. Uh, so that includes France and Germany and, and United Kingdom. And so we have this outlandishly high military budget. Uh, 
So we stopped the war. Uh, I think we can be proud of that. Um, by the way, that doesn't mean I have any hostility to people who fought in the war. Um, they, you know, to Americans who fought in the war, they were doing what, either what they thought was right or they were doing what their government told them to do. And from my point of view, they just didn't understand what the war was really about. And, you know, we, as a, somebody who was born in 1948 and brought up in the 50s, I was brought up, even as a Quaker who opposed wars, I was brought up to think that the United States was always on the right side of things. Uh, we were for freedom and democracy. But the fact of the matter is that since World War II, there hasn't been a war that we've fought in that was for freedom and democracy. It's all been about uh, trying to force smaller countries to do things the way we want business to be done. And I use that word business deliberately because I think it really was, it, it, it was what, we, what our military might is really about is making the world safe for American business uh, and for business in general. So it, the whole thing then in my mind then just raises questions about um, we need to have uh, what Bernie Sanders would call a political revolution. We need, we need to have a change in the way we do our economy so that working people uh, have more say over what goes on. Uh, right now, I think much of our political machinery is controlled by really wealthy people who can contribute unlimited amounts of funds. We have an election going on right now in Philadelphia where the richest man in Pennsylvania is, is, has contributed, I believe it's three quarters of a million dollars to try to stop certain candidates. You know, that kind of, uh, that's, that's not democracy. That's what some people would call plutocracy, the, the rule of money rather than the rule of the people. So I, I'm proud of the history that I got to play a, a small role in uh, and, and also at the same time humbled by the amount of work we still have left to do to try to get rid of all of our nuclear weapons. Um, and I really have no doubt that if the United States went to Russia uh, and went to China, uh, and, and of course <laughs> the United States, or the United Kingdom and France, those being the biggest nuclear powers, and said, we, we want to get rid of all our nuclear weapons. Can you help us? <laughs> uh, if you get rid of yours, we'll get rid of ours. And then we could go to Pakistan and India and Israel uh, and say, you need to get rid of yours too. Um, I, I think that we could do that. Um, but, and I think we can cut the Pentagon budget and take that $850 billion that we spend every year on preparing for war and instead use it for all the needs that we have around the world. The needs, you know, how, how, many, how many wind turbines could we build? How many schools could we build? How many teachers could we teach? How many doctors could we teach? Um, you know, how, how many solar panels can we build? And we could, we could give people jobs. Um, you know, that this is not, this is not uh, an anti-job thing. We could take all that money that goes into the military and put it to good use. Um, but it's going to take some kind of a political revolution to do it. And I'm hoping to be part of such a political revolution. And uh, I hope uh, the those that are listening to this show will also join in some kind of a political revolution like that. Yeah, uh, I had a question. So you said that you um, uh, were against the war before you went on this trip on the Phoenix. And so uh, what was it that first started to turn you against the war? Oh, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, you know, I said I was raised as a Quaker. Quakers for 300 and some years have been opposed to all wars. Um, but 
I was, this, you know, I was a teenager. I was, and I was a little, little bit rebellious. So I thought to myself, if my mother is against this war, I'm, I'm probably for it. <laughs> uh, you know, she's naive, and, um, and so I was, I was sort of, and I had read a book. Um, and I can't know if I remember the name of it right now, but it was by a Catholic missionary um, who had been doing missionary work, uh, a, a doctor who had been doing uh, medical missionary work in Southeast Asia. And I had read that book, and he was anti-communist. I wasn't pro-communist, uh, but, you know, but I grew up in the 50s, uh, and so... And I, li I liked his, the fact that he was curing people of diseases and helping them out. Good, good, you know, good uh, humanitarian work. And so I, so I had read his book and I thought, well, you know, he was against the communists in Vietnam and, and all of Southeast Asia. So I am too. So I, so I started kind of objecting to my mother's anti-war line that she was giving me. And she said, well, why don't you read this book, a little booklet by the American Friends Service Committee called Peace in Vietnam. And I thought, you're darn right, I'll read it. I'll learn all of their arguments and I'll learn how to shoot them down. And I'll, you know, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to get wise about this. Well, it turned out that this book, it wasn't, an, it wasn't an argument for pacifism, although the, the authors were pacifists. They looked specifically at this war and said, what are we doing in Vietnam? And I mentioned earlier uh, that it wasn't about democracy. We took over from the French. The French had colonized Vietnam for 100 years or so, and we were taking over when, when they gave up. They were defeated by Ho Chi Minh's forces. Uh, but we took over and prevented the elections from being held. So. <clears throat> So ironically, I guess the thing I can say <laughs> about myself is at least I was willing to, to listen to the truth. Uh, and so ironically, you know, I, I read this book in order to, to out-argue my mother and convince her she was wrong, and I became convinced that this was wrong. And, and it was eye-opening to me because I had been raised in the 50s, and, and in the 50s, you know, every, everything about the United States was thought to be positive. That was the, the, the gloss that we had on everything. The economy was booming for many people. Of course, there, we now know that there were many people that were hungry. There were many people that were in poverty. Um, but they weren't getting the headlines. Um, and so it was like nothing, the United States can do no wrong. And even though I was not pro-war particularly in general, that was the atmosphere that I grew up in. I'd been a Cub Scout. I would salute the flag. Um, and, um, and it was shocking to me to discover that not only was, was all war bad, but this particular war, there was just no good reason for us to be there. And, and initially... I thought this was just one big mistake. And a lot of people were saying, you know, the United States just, our, our officials just made a mistake in Vietnam. But, and, and for a long time, that's what I believed. The more I read about it, then the more I discovered, well, actually, we had been trying, especially since World War II, you could go further back to the time when we invaded the Philippines, when we invaded Hawaii, uh, and uh, when we got Guantanamo Naval Base in Cuba, you could go further back. But especially since World War II, the, the places, there have been dozens and dozens of countries, literally dozens of countries, where either our military or our CIA went in and either actively invaded or supported forces that were kind of like the, the South Vietnamese forces. We were supporting the elites in the country against the working people of the country. Um, so 
in Iran, uh, a, a moderate government was elected by the people in 1950s, 54, I believe it was. Uh, and that government said, you know what? The oil that's under our soil, that should be ours. That should be Iranian oil. It shouldn't be British Petroleum. It shouldn't be Esso, which was what was Exxon today, uh, or Shell. It should be our oil. So they nationalized the oil. So what did the United States do? They got together with Britain and they said, let's overthrow that government. Uh, and we're still reaping the penalty for that today. The enmity between Iran and the United States is really, um, was generated at that time. Um, so there was Iran. There was Guatemala, where there was a, a, a moderate government that was elected democratically. And they decided, um, they had these huge land holdings that belonged to United Fruit uh, of the United States and also the wealthy elites there. Um, and so we said, well, that's no good. Uh, we, and we overthrew that government. So, you know, it, it, it's sad for me to say it, but, you know, uh, you know, Vietnam, the only thing that was a mistake about Vietnam was that, that the Vietnamese resisted in a way that we couldn't handle it. Um, these other countries, we were able to successfully overthrow their governments, leading to decades of turmoil. And why do we have so many refugees from Central America today? Because we were down there with our troops, with our tax dollars, supporting the elites against the working people. And, and all of that turmoil is now the chickens coming home to roost here. Those, the, those economies were devastated. And now those people have no good place to turn to except to try to make it so many of them to the United States. Yeah, try to run for their lives. That's right. That's right. The, the saying that I've heard is, those people are here because we were there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just about to run out of time. So, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to us and uh, tell the story of the Phoenix. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.